day Dwayne brought some um, sandy looking clay material from one of his trips out into the hills so I poured it into some water and I've, it's been soaking overnight and it's um, there's quite a, I, I put it through a strainer first and then so but there's quite a few very coarse sandy uh, bits in it that um, won't be yielding any clay but it, there's there's an interesting color of material that's suspended in the water so I take this fabric it's just an old curtain nice and light and I double it over and I put it onto a bucket nice piece of elastic here just to hold it on and put a little hollow in it so it'll hold and um, I could stir it up so that the it's in suspension in the water and uh, pour it through so anything fine enough is going to go through and as we get to the thicker sludge, it needs to be agitated before it gets in. And this is a really great way to process things, material that you're not really sure if there's any clay in it. Because the clay is going to um, easily be suspended in water. So there's that, and then that's going to be a little bit there we can maybe use as a slip or something. You can see some really interesting color in the bottom here. Um, quite a beautiful color when it's when it's wet. It's quite dark when it's when it's um, dry. It's almost purple. Um, but I don't. I could put more water in here and swish it around and get a little more out, but I think that's about all we're going to get out of out of that. So I just find a place and dump the rest, and that's that becomes part of the landscape again. And so this carefully I remove and. 
hopefully we didn't get too much stuff in here and then I'm gonna let that settle and then pour the water off and um, eventually render it down to where we have perhaps some clay so that's it. Welcome to my outdoor studio. It's a beautiful morning. It's going to be a squelcher hot day today. So I'm going to make some pots before it gets too hot. I've got a really nice lump of clay here that I processed from the clay that we collected after the storm. I'm calling this the storm clay, but it came from just up the road. And it's lovely and elastic and easy to work. So I'm going to do a little wedging. It's always good to remember that a master makes things look really easy. And I'm not a master, but I'm hoping that you can relate to my process of exploration. I'm just getting to know this particular clay body, but I have made a pot with it. It was a larger pot, which demands a lot more from your clay. So I know what it can do to a certain extent. And I'm just going to show you a smaller pot and uh, hopefully you'll get just how easy it is. <laughs> but I will be running into some problems, I'm sure, and you can see how I deal with it. So I wedged it up a little bit. It's um, just a very yummy clay so I'm using a little terracotta planter saucer you know there you can get them pretty much anywhere that sells pots for plants and um, this is this is uh, what they call in the Pueblo pottery tradition they call this the puki it's just a little form that you start your pot in and you can turn it really easily because if you just started with clay and tried to turn it, it would stick to whatever you're using. I also have this cool old, um, I don't know what you call it, it's a stool with a spinning top on it, kind of like a piano stool. Um, and uh, it's been very handy for uh, just for setting setting my pots on while I'm building. Well, it works a little bit like a potter's wheel, but you're just uh, turning it very slowly when you're hand building. So, and I'm going to wedge up a little piece, and just slowly form it into a into a tortilla shape and um, I find it kind of helpful to just run a rolling pin over it I guess because I've had lots of experience making pies and just give it a little more of a consistent thickness you don't really want a super thick bottom, but in a way it doesn't matter because you can carve it away later if you want it thinner. And then I'm just going to center my pookie on this and work the clay into the pookie so that it's touching just gently touching. You don't want to just really squeeze it in there because you don't really want it to stick and, as it starts drying. Now I had plenty there, but uh, I just trim it off with my knife 
kind of like making a pie crust. So some people are really, really quite meticulous about how it's trimmed and everything, but all that tiddling is going to happen later anyway. So I'm just looking for a good edge. It's a little bit more here than I need. Just looking for a good edge to put my coil, my first coil onto. I'm just doing this just to kind of get more of a even thickness in the bottom, but I will be using my rib uh, later to get that really smooth, so I'm not too worried about making it all just perfect at this point. So that's ready for the first coil. Now this canvas table is lovely for wedging. But here in the desert, things just dry out so fast. So I'm going to use this piece of Formica, which I just got for rolling out coils because it doesn't tend to dry out as fast. And you don't want your coils to dry um, until your pot's done. So... I'm just, I'm going to kind of get it started. Now, my, my sense of it is, is that it's, it's already wanting to crack on the surface a little bit. So I'm just going to, I'm going to wet it and uh, just get it nice and slippery. Now some people just do the whole coil like this, but because we have a hot sunny day shaping up already, we, we might get some cracking, so I'm just going to get it started and then I'm going to start rolling it. It's a little bit wet for the Formica, but as I roll it, it's going to dry out. Now you want it do even pressure and some people even turn it once in a while in opposite directions just so that if it's been squished and it's fatter on one side than the other you get a little more of a average out diameter doing that and then continue rolling so what I'm getting is I'm noticing a nice kind of gummy surface to it which will adhere really nicely to the bottom uh, piece. I'm going to just apply a wee bit of water around the edge because it's been sitting there for a few minutes. And I'm going to score it with my scoring rib, the serrated rib that I have. And this actually makes it so that your um, fresh coil will adhere. Some people will score your, the coil as well. Some people will put a little bit of slip, which is really goopy, wet clay in there, uh, just to kind of glue it together. But um, it just depends on how much moisture your clay is demanding in order to stick. And I think we've got enough moisture on the coil that it's going to stick just fine. So then I start and I press the coil down and I just kind of let the coil lay there where it wants to be on the on the surface of the table because you know why tempt it to break if you don't need to and I'll just cut this off and you kind of want the edges to match up good and you know it wouldn't hurt just a little bit of uh, moisture in there, maybe a little scoring. It's just one of those spots that, you know, when you're 
when it's drying or firing, it might be just a little weak block right there. I'm going to use my thumb to work some of that clay down and really meld it into the base. I just find that it's, it's easier if I can bend over like this and work that coil on the outside like I did with my thumb on the inside and just work it down in there where it's really well melded all the way around. And of course as you go up with your coils you can uh, you can meld the outside easier because it's not right up against the edge of the pookie. Okay so I'm happy with with how it's adhering and now I'm going to just shape this coil a little bit. I'm just going to put it, um, kind of keep it sort of centered. It doesn't have to be exactly centered because it's not going around at a million miles an hour the way a potter's wheel does. You can just kind of turn it with your hand as you need to and just go around and really don't even have to look at it at this point. You can just close your eyes and and feel the thickness and you're just kind of working your coil into um, a pot shape into the thickness that you want. Now you don't want to really go for the final super thin or whatever thickness because as you work up and put your next coil on you're still going to be squeezing that first coil so um, I'm just preparing it so that it's got a nice firm um, surface for the next coil to go on and I'm feeling around at the bottom of the pookie just to make sure that it's nice there. You can even kind of run it like a um, potter's wheel and just get it you know nice and consistent there and I can do the same thing on the inside with my thumb so I know that it's it's well formed I don't have to be worrying as it's drying or as it's firing that I did some little thing that weakened it in its initial structure. So the best thing to do is to just bring it up as a cylinder, make sure it's very, very strong that way, and then, and then in the end you slowly bring your final shape into being. And it's looking good. So I'm going to go back and make another coil. So a word about the coils. Um, people will ask, well, where do you do you just put the coil, attach the coil onto the top of the existing structure or to the inside or to the outside? When you're melding, do you do you bring the bottom clay up over the crack or the top clay down? It really just kind of depends on what you're thinking of with your shape and also how much clay you have underneath your your uh, coil like your your previous coil if you feel like you want to bring more clay up then simply run your thumb or your fingers up if you feel like you're you you've got you've thinned it out enough then you can just bring your coil down and um, it, there's no hard and fast rule, as you're probably getting. Um, just feel it out. If you, if you feel like you need to move clay into an area because it's a bit thin, go ahead and do it. At this point, you should be able to do whatever you need to do with your clay uh, to get it consistent. I keep checking with just be between my fingers. I just keep checking to see if there's any really big area where where it just feels like there's a big lump or something that I need to squeeze out. The coils are not always perfectly consistent in width. There's with hand building it there's there's it's just kind of an average that you're going for. So 
um, there's there's some different methods that I've picked up for um, for working towards a consistent thickness, and one of them um, was from the Mata Ortiz potters, who are just absolutely amazing. Check out the Mexican um, Pueblo people at uh, Mata Ortiz. They do just amazing stuff. Anyway, their toolkit is very, very simple, and one of them is a hacksaw blade. And this is a, a thing that I learned from them, and it's, it's wonderful. You, you actually run the hacksaw blade up the wall, and you can kind of see where the dips and hills are, and you can kind of just scrape the clay into more of a consistent plane. I keep my hand on the inside so I can actually press pretty good on the outside and it becomes very obvious. Um, it's kind of like a little plane, like a little, uh, you know, a little carpentry tool that you would use maybe to, to plane wood. It just get, you know, you can see it, especially in this situation where I'm working with the sun, I can get the sun shining on it in a, in a certain way, and I can really see there's really an obvious dip here and an obvious uh, lump there. And this is just kind of the beginning of going for a consistent thickness. I'm working the lumps upward and it, those um, inconsistencies are all going to gather around the top, logically. So don't worry about the texture, that's all going to get smoothed. Now, I gotta get down and look and see if there's any obvious lumps. There seems to be one there. It really doesn't hurt to just trim off, make sure your trimming tool is clean so that it slices through the clay really easy. Clean the hands, it's always nice. Wipe off the drips. And I'm just gonna cut off this high spot here it's as we refine our shape these these little anomalies just become a little more noticeable until finally when you get to your rim it can just set your whole rim off so I just kind of carved that off of there um, some people use a needle tool the Mata Ortiz people use a syringe, a surgical syringe, to cut off, trim off the top. Some people are very, very, they want to trim the top every coil. Um, other people just leave it for the end. Master potters have, you know, I've noticed through YouTube watching different master potters, they all do it differently. They have their way that works for them. And some of them won't trim the top until they, just before they start refining their rim. Um, so, just depends on how fussy you are. So I'm just eyeballing this. And it looks pretty good. Kind of hard to tell where to put your head, you know, or your eyeball. But that looks pretty good. It's, it's a little warbly, but not um, in a big way. Just in finger pinching texture. So I'm thinking that my next coil I'm going to start becoming aware in my shaping that I'm going to bring it in. So now would be a really good time to refine the inside a little bit because as you bring the rim, the shape in, it gets a little harder to get inside small is not necessarily easier. So with the rib and the sun shining on the edges, you can really see when there's a dip or a hill on the inside. And why not just go for really making it 
nice and smooth. Even though this pot will probably be fairly closed at the top and you won't really see a lot of this. While we can get at it, we may as well make it as nice as we can. Later on, when you're in the sanding stage, you can go in with the sandpaper, but this is definitely the easiest time to refine your pot when the clay is nice and soft. So that's pretty good. I could get I could get really crazy with with the details, but then I'm going to be fooling around with this pot for a while longer and my fingers are going in as you can see, so I'm already, you know, fingering over what I did with the rib, so don't need to get you're not, you know, working on the final product at this point. You're just kind of making it easier for yourself as you go further in. I just dinged the outside, so I'm just evening that out. So, um, I'm going to go for my next coil. I made uh, four pots today, and uh, two were with the local, our local clay and the other two were very experimental with some white clay that we got at Dead Man Valley. Um, I just really want to check that clay out and make sure that it will actually fire as a clay body, but um, I may end up just using it as a white slip because it was very difficult to, to form even small pots with. So this one, I just uh, took it off the pookie and put it on my banding wheel. Um, it seems like it's leather hard, so I'm very, very, very careful with it because it is still very soft. And uh, and I'm going to trim the trim the bottom into a nice. Um, a nice flowing shape. You can see there's a mark there from the from the pookie. So I'd like to just get that down to where the whole sh the whole shape flows right from the foot. And uh, it's always a little bit scary doing this because, especially if you're not familiar with with the, the pookie and the thickness that you can go to when you're carving. But I'm, look, I'm checking the inside and it's quite round on the inside so I think I can safely uh, carve away a fair amount of this corner without going right through the pot. Which happens sometimes that's uh, one thing that you have to um, come to terms with when you're potting, especially when you're just being uh, an intrepid pioneer with your clay, like I'm doing. You have to enjoy the process and um, accept the failures as part of the learning. Uh, which is kind of the secret to a happy life, I think. So, um, I, even though I'm, I'm making these pots, putting as much energy as I can into making them beautiful, um, I realized that I really don't know what this clay is going to do when it's fired, and my pots could completely blow up or crack or do all kinds of things even before it's fired. Um, it could just prove that it, the, the clay body is not sufficient, uh, plastic enough to even uh, survive the drying. <laughs> um, but I do have three dried ones and they did fine, so I'm, I'm hopeful. I think this is actually a fairly nice clay body after working with the other one, 
the white one this morning, I would say that this one is um, quite doable. I've I've worked with easier clay, but I think it's it's a matter of of doing lots of wedging and uh, and really just working it until it's very very plastic, and then it kind of will behave with the hand building. Having a good hand building clay is is uh, is a whole other thing compared to having a good clay for throwing on the wheel. You, it needs to be very understanding. So it looks like I'm actually getting past this little groove that the Pookie made and uh, it's still very damp so I'm not going to get it super smooth but I think I can disappear that that line and get a really nice um, a really nice shape from the bottom up like a sorry like a uh, an ascending shape from a small bottom is kind of what I I'm sort of partial to So I was doing a little research about the Pueblo potters and of course one of the most famous Pueblo potters is uh, Maria Martinez. She's no longer with us in this world but she, uh, she was one of the first Pueblo potters to actually um, become known outside of, of um, her Pueblo. And she was a master potter, um, which means a person that goes out and gets the clay, processes the clay, makes the pot, does the decorating, does the firing, and um, she said uh, the, the thing that really, really changed for her and, and brought the quality of her pots up to this flawless state was she discovered sandpaper. And this would have been back in the, I don't know, maybe the 20s or something. And she discovered that sandpaper came in many different grades and so she really got, got that down. Um, to where she could just make her pots like it's just smooth and shiny as glass and she would sand it uh, like what I'm doing I started with a hundred grit and uh, you'd sand it down so that you pretty much have all the divots out which is kind of where I've gotten this one too and the divots are sort of show up as little dark uh, bits but I'm really close to disappearing them all, and so then I'm going to go into a, a different grit uh, sandpaper and keep on going until I get it smooth enough where I can actually do a burnished layer. So I'm, for the first time, sanding a pot like Maria Martinez. Yeah, sure makes it smooth. So it's a new season. Finally warm enough in the studio to be making some pots. And um, I just made this pot um, a couple of days ago and I just successfully turned it upside down. And now I'm trimming the bottom of it. Good to do that while it's still somewhat soft, although you can distort it a lot if you don't turn it carefully. But I have this bowl that seems to support it quite well, so um, I'm just going to leave it in there and take it out probably tomorrow when it gets firm enough to hold its own. There's a pot over there that is 
firm enough to hold its own, and that's basically the shape and, and size of, of this one. And I've been experimenting with a very ancient construction method, which uses a paddle and anvil. So I made this little paddle, carved it out of a piece of cedar, and you get it wet, and you put the anvil inside the pot, and you pat the pot. Maybe when I'm doing that, Dwayne can come and film me doing it, but I'm really happy with it because I can get the walls of the pots really thin and really firm and strong considering how thin they are and I used the paddle and anvil for this bowl this morning and um, it's it's very thin and consistent and um, if it works, um, I'm going to use this pot to form other pots on top of it. It'll be a form, a form pot for the bottoms, and then, um, and then I'll be able to uh, make more sort of this size. like this one. So this, this big guy, I, um, I'm just turning it and drying it. And it, um, I used uh, one of these bowls for a form for the bottom half, or just for the bottom so that I could take it off. So you just lay the clay on top and paddle it down onto the form and then lift it off. And it's quite thin and it's quite large and that's the first time it's sat on its own bottom. So I'm quite happy with it. It's a little asymmetrical but it's got a lovely feel to it and it's just a great opportunity for decoration. Um, I might put it back in here just to continue drying. I'm scared that it, because it's such a big one, that it might just collapse under its own weight. So still a bit damp on the bottom. So I'm just kind of tipping it so it'll dry and turning it. And after a couple more days, it's going to be pretty much dry. And then I can sand it. It doesn't need much sanding, but there's a few little divots here and there that I like to smooth out. I noticed there's a couple on this pot here. It's easier to smooth out with your thumb than it is with a sandpaper, so try and get them as perfect as you can while they're leather hard. Anyway, it's exciting. It's a new, it's a whole new method and it's um, the, the clay, the local clay, the storm clay that I'm using is awesome for this. It's weathered through 20, 30 below in here in the buckets because last year I worked on processing the clay. So now I have lots of clay to work with and it froze and it seems to be just fine. Um, this is some that I just opened up today and um, it just wedges up beautifully. So we've got we've got a winner here with our clay. It's just got a beautiful consistency. And now after all the test firing we did over the winter, we know it has a beautiful color too. part of um, being able to decorate your pots very artistically is having the right brushes and 
I just wanted to share with you some of these wonderful brushes that I have. Um, they, these ones were made in Japan, and um, the Japanese have, well, probably the longest tradition um, in the world of, of making pottery. And um, they're, they're just, they're wonderful brushes. They're, they're made of bamboo and, and various types of uh, hair. I think this one is goat hair. Um, they are chosen um, hair by hair for, to make the bristles um, lie properly. And um, I've treasured these. I've used these for years and years. Um, there's another one which is a little bit softer and so you would use it for uh, larger areas and they even put a little ribbon at the end so you can hang it up if you want and most of these are goat, goat hair and and you know these are for applying large um, areas of, of slips um, so I what I was interested in is getting some really fine lines and uh, in my research, I found that a lot of people, that, uh, the Pueblo people, when they get these really fine lines in their designs, they actually make their own brushes. So I um, got some cedar and um, split the ends, and I put some goldy hair in, in the ends. And, um, and I'm able to, they're gradiated. And I think there's probably about five hairs in this one. And I'm able to actually load uh, the uh, slip onto that and, and just lay it onto the pot as I'm, as I'm moving the pot on my banding wheel. So I'm, I'm able to control a very nice, long, thin line with that. And if, if you're not so up on making your own brushes, you can actually find... Um, brushes like like it not quite as fine but I've used this one a lot um, this one I just got at a at a hobby store and it's um what do they call it a pinstripe brush so you, these are designed for the same kind of thing but they're just a little wider I've got I've got a few of them and um, I tend to just like keep them stuck all together so it, it keeps the hairs straight. Um, just give them a little bit of saliva after you're done using them and it keeps them nice and straight. Brushes are everything for the, for the person who wants to paint really fine design work, which I'm particularly attached to. I think it's, it's the ultimate um, Thing that you can do for your pot is to just give it um, a really gorgeous design that connects you with the place where the clay came from and where the artist is living. By the way, while we're talking about brushes and painting, these are leaves from uh, one of our yucca plants that we have growing. And yucca has been uh, traditionally the source of these fine paintbrushes down in the in the pueblos. Uh, all or most of the pueblo potters, I don't know now, um, like to use yucca fibers. So um, I'm trying to separate some yucca fibers here to just show you. Um, they have like little hairs that the fibers. I would almost think they need a little, a little wetting so that they'll they'll split, and the more you split them, the more uh, hairs you get, and the finer it gets, and then they just kind of. This is a very rough one, okay, but um, I don't personally use yucca brushes. Because I think, well, that's what the old ones used when there was nothing else available. Um, I'm quite happy with my beautiful Japanese brushes and my little brushes that I got at the craft store. They're working very well. Um, but uh, these, these yucca um, fibers would also work very well for certain 
um, for certain things. You see it. it um, and I've seen them used, and it really depends on the pressure and how you drag your um, your uh, oxides um, in, you know, what direction and everything. But there's your primitive paintbrush, which you can do amazing things with if you practice. This is a mixture of of a black um, oxide uh, powder, um, which is mostly manganese, I believe, and I've added it to the red slip. And it still looks quite red, but when you mix it up and paint it on, it looks fairly black, and it fires nicely into a black. So for the time being, I'm using the manganese for uh, an additive to my to my red slip and this is the brush that I used for this stripe and this is the brush that I have been using for these fine stripes. So I had um, a piece of paper and I estimated the four quadri the quadrature just to get a symmetry. And then I did my banding there and my banding down here and then I've been um, applied the white slip, which is this one. Doesn't look very white, does it? However, this is the white slip. You can see when it dries, it's quite a bit whiter. And this is what we scraped off the hoodoos at, up at Dead Man Valley, uh, where they were brilliantly white in the sun. And uh, it's been very good. I have two, white slip number one and white slip number two, uh, which seem to behave slightly differently. They came from two different places in the valley. Um, one uh, acts really well for large areas without cracking, and one works for lines without cracking. And they don't seem to work interchangeably in those situations. So this is stuff that I've just learned through, um, a, you know, applying and firing and drying and seeing what works and what doesn't. So this is, these are the characteristics of the clay that I, I'm using from this area and um, takes a while to figure it out. Lots of trial and error, um, but it's lots of fun to do because uh, it gets you out and um, it gets you detached from from the results in, in terms of just hanging on to a finished pot that's perfect. You just let go of that and uh, and get excited about the process. So so this little banding wheel is really handy for doing precise work, but uh, sometimes I just use this nice soft. Um, padding um, I get comfortable because when you're working with a brush and you're doing precise brush work which is what I really want to, to do um, you need to get your body comfortable and you need to be able to change direction um, easily so if I was um, so I've already blocked these out but they need another coat so I'm going to just show you so when I when I start at this point here, I kind of want I want it so that I can I can run the brush in the comfortable way, and then I'm going to have to change position as I work. So I'm I'm using um, another I have two <laughs> containers of of my mix here. They're they're basically the same. So this is um, this is one that has actually soaked for a couple of days. It was completely dried out. And all I have to do is add water and stir, and 
Um, so I don't like to waste any of it. Um, so I just roll um, my bristles in there and work it up the sides as the, the you know the side of the little container is like is like your palette and you kind of have to distribute this stuff really well uh, into into the brush because if there's lumps it'll just immediately get sucked into your clay and it'll make a little lump as you, you know you can see that there are so okay so I'm holding the brush the way it's comfortable for me to get a good swipe and I'm moving my pot to where it's the good position for it so I'm, I'm laying the second coat on it doesn't go very far sometimes I have to twirl my brush and get some more on there so it, it's it's a slow process but because the brush is long it makes a consistent line so I you know it's going to take a, a while it'll take you know a couple hours to just get these um, nicely um, laid out so um, I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to thicken these lines um, but because they're they're laid out now I originally laid them out with some pencil and then I put the white slip over top the pencil and now I'm getting my black slip on on top and I know where I'm going with the design and um, at least this far so I have a feeling about the design and how it's going to go but the pot makes the decisions ultimately the shape of the pot asks for the design so you have to really really cuddle with your pot and get what it's wanting from from you and um, so I got this little you know piece of paper that's handy it looks like I was drawing a picture of the roof of the studio on the paper oh yeah so that's the table um, so what I'm seeing is is a pot that um, is has got these nice uh, kind of rainbow shapes and and then within the rainbow shape I'm kind of wanting something like this and then maybe um, some steps and then maybe something in the middle with some steps and that these would be black so this is the idea but as I go along I may find that you know once I get that idea started on my pot that the pot actually says no I think maybe we need to go in another direction or you know after I do it I might think the black and white isn't balanced enough or so this is where your discernment at you know in your eye as they say your artist's eye is going to get the message from from the actual pot and what I mean by that is this pot is unique it's hand built it's not molded in a, you know a shape where it can be reproduced en masse it, it has its own shape it's ha it has some irregularities and so in order to get a design that works with the pot you have to just kind of go along with the with with that shape and uh, really be sensitive to it I'm not saying I'm always successful at that this is a constant um, journey that all all people who want to um, manifest beauty as art have uh, go through with everything and it's a little bit scary sometimes when you put a lot of energy into something creatively and then you blow it you get off track you're not listening and you just gotta let it go <laughs> and say well it's less than satisfactory however maybe I'll do better next time <laughs>
just making these stars. They're coming together. So it's morning and it's looking like a possible firing day. There's just a little bit of a breeze, but we're hoping that it's going to be um, calm enough that it's not going to make the fire flare up and make an uneven situation for the pot. So this is the warming up stage and I've got, I've been burning a little fire for a few hours, just warming up the fireplace and I'm warming up the uh, Kamador, which is the container that I'm using to protect the pots and uh, during the firing. And I'm warming up uh, the bricks that I will be propping the Kamador on. And uh, ev everything's getting warmed up while the pot is in the oven and it's warming up. So the idea is to bring everything up to a nice, warm, almost hot temperature, load it all up, and then build the fire over it. Trust. Whatever happens, even if it cracks, I'll love it. <laughs> this is why I wanted to build the fire pit, the fireplace out in the open. The door just cracked and fell apart and the pot is now um, taking the full flame. So I'm thinking I'm going to move the fire away from the pot otherwise it's going to burn the color out. But I'm going to do it gently. It almost, I can't tell, but it almost looks like the pot is still intact. But it's taking a lot of flame, which is going to burn color out. So I'm going to gently move this away from the pot and see if I can salvage it. Now I understand why people put wires around their camadors <laughs> to hold them together. Because they do crack. smokes and almost looks like that pot is intact but definitely the colors are burning out so it got too hot wow my flower pot completely disintegrated I'm not going to be able wire that one back together. <laughs> Gonna have to buy one of those Mexican flower pots, those hand-built ones <laughs> that they use down there. Holy smokes, look at that pot. I'm excited. The port that I had it sitting on um, collapsed. See that? Oh yeah, it's cracking all the way around now. Well, in the kiln with the pottery, um, I've got one layer here. I can't put a lot in this load because my pots are fairly wide. This is just a 17 inch um, kiln here, so 
the, I think the best I can do with this load will be two pots. I've got everything loaded nice and even, so I'm still not sure about this clay and just what it will take. But uh, that's all ready to go, so I'm going to close the kiln. Um, almost closed the kiln. I'm going to leave the lid open like this. I'll just put a, a post underneath it. can be anything. Um, so I got it open a little bit and I've got the spy holes open. These little holes on the side of the kiln. These are open. Um, I have a little plug and so when I'm actually firing I usually plug the top one and close the lid but for now I'm going to leave everything open so the idea is that we're going to put it on warm up a nice long warm up if if you feel unsure about how much moisture there might still be in your clay these pots have been around for a while, so um, there's not a lot of moisture in them. This is the desert, and there's not a lot of moisture in the air. The ambient humidity is always very, very low. So, um, But I just want to make sure that uh, I don't shock the pots with a lot of temperature changes, fast temperature changes. Um, you know, things get change the temperature gets changed a lot faster when you're doing outdoor firing but what I'm doing with this kiln is I'm trying to test the limits of the clay and just see you know in a controlled environment just how much um, these these pots will take they're fairly large pots they're handmade pots out of local clay so what will they take this is the question and every firing gives us some answers um, as to just uh, what it's capable of. Also what I'm testing is the um, slips, the oxides that I actually applied for decoration um, just to see how stable they will be once they've fused into the clay body. So I'm going to turn the kiln on to warm up which is basically just pressing the um, the little button that's in the kiln sitter. Um, so it's, you can hear it, the light's on. Um, I'm going to put this on to estimated, uh, uh, let's see what time is it, it's probably close to noon, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, um, put it on to 16 hours because that'll take us into tomorrow morning when we can actually um, turn this dial up, which means that we're bringing in more of the elements into play. Um, and it's on manual low, which just means it's just on this slow warm up. It's a great little kiln. There's not a whole lot of uh, uh, things you need to do to um, regulate it. I was a bit concerned that I might not be able to regulate the, t the rise of the temperature properly because of the lack of uh, most kilns have separate um, dials for each element and whereas this one just has this one but um, it uh, it seems to regulate it quite well just with where it is uh, when you're turning the dial um, the timing is sort of built into it how, how long the elements uh, actually go on and click off you can hear it just clicked off so it's very very slow warm-up and uh, I got, I could just feel that it's slightly warm inside um, right now and uh, overnight it'll get so that I probably can still put my hand in but not for very long. So it, it's a very, very slow warm up, which is what we want for this clay. My teeth are <laughs> washed my face. I just had to come check the kiln this morning. And we have a beautiful pot. I'm so happy with that pot. You might want to look at the cone. I bet the cone melted. Take 
take the shelf out so you can see. So if you can get the camera, I don't know if you can see that the cone has melted there. So when the cone melted, this little thing went down and it um, turned the heat off. So that's what it looks like when it melts. So it basically just loses its strength to, to, to hold the little pin up, uh, which uh, when it goes down, it lets go of the little latch in the front. This little latch here is the pin is attached to. Um, so when this is down, it holds it holds that down. When it melts, it lifts it up, and that falls and releases the, the breaker. It turns it off. So it did that, and uh, look at that. Now, isn't that beautiful? Oh boy, oh boy. Very successful firing. This is the third firing and it's still really warm in here, but I still haven't learned my lesson. I tend to just always want to rush into these things while they're still hot. Probably all those years of doing Raku. Anyway, there's my little, my little lizard planter. Very nice. And my Mitsudomo. Okay, I can see that the um, there's crackle. The white slip was maybe too thick, but it's crackled off. The pot itself looks good though. Looks integral. Too bad. So I'll probably put some kind of sealer in there and hope that it doesn't all chip off, but the white slip is it's tricky. It doesn't it's not really even clay. It's it's really just pulverized rock and it acts very differently than clay. And I've had this happen a few times with it. You can see where it's a little thinner maybe. It didn't crack, but then up here closer to the curve, a little more clay or a little more slip got piled in there and it's a bit too thick. So I have to be really careful not to put it on too thick if I want to keep using it. But I really like it. You can see my Cone 06, so this firing was just a little bit hotter than the last one. So we'll see how these how these pots react to having a little more temperature. Mm. Looks good. <clears throat> Beautiful. Magpies. And this is another one with some white slip, we'll see. And it looks better. I don't see that crackle. So I think we're good on that one. Another magpie. So tell us about your magpies. Well, this little ball is about uh, a magpie that I saw up in the tree the one day when I was walking. Um, it's a snowy, you know, it's a winter scene. And he was up in the tree and over by the river. And 
This is the sagebrush and this the checkerboard is just kind of like the I I sort of see it as the light and dark changes of the environment and then this that's those are the river turbulence of the river so just the symbolic elements and I love this guy because it looks very almost like a yin yang symbol and they're very those birds are very black and white yin and yang and they're tricksters too Eleven geese are honking. Wow. These are the Canada geese that Goldie loves to chase down at the river. There's eleven of them. This is a hot pot. I can feel it through my gloves. There's a slight crack on the bottom, but not much. The larger pots are more of a challenge. Um, when I'm making them, I have to make sure I really compress the bottoms uh, when they're when it's still wet clay and make them really, really strong. Because that's a lot of clay moving around with the temperature changes. But I'm happy with that. That's a tiny, tiny little hairline crack, and it probably doesn't even go all the way through. So that's the red, uh, the red slip from Dead Man Valley, and the white slip, and then um, the black is uh, the red slip with the black uh, um, manganese added to it. Rather than putting a clear glaze over these. Um, they're not really shedding. At this temperature, this is good. They're not really shedding, so I may not put a sealer on these ones. The red. No, it's pretty good. So that's a good temperature. They're more, it's more stable than the uh, other pots were. Welcome to my beautiful studio. Dwayne and I built this a couple of years ago, just mostly to store pots in, but now I find that I'm really enjoying working in here. And I just wanted to show you some of the test pots that you've seen get constructed on this video and just show you what the results were. So you might, you might remember this shape. Um, this was fired in our wood stove over the first winter and the um, black that I was testing burnt out so I ended up just kind of like putting the design back on with a felt pen <laughs> and um, it was actually a very nicely burnished pot but um, it cracked in here and um, it's a test pot. So it was never meant to be anything more than that. And we, we found out that this clay, which was originally from the, what we call the clay road, um, really wasn't very good for hand building because of the crack that it sustained at that point of tension. So. Um, I think this one might have been one of the first ones that you saw me make. Um, and it's a lovely little pot. And the color of the clay body is quite beautiful. This was just fired in a cooking fire outside one day when we were making, um, I think we were doing some salmon. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that looks like a good, uh, a good spot to try this little pot that I'd made. 
So when it came out, um, I just painted on some designs because if you'll recall, I was still longing to find the pigments for de design work. And at the time, all I really had was, was uh, paint that didn't really hold up to firing. But um, it didn't crack. Um, so I kind of like it. Um, this one was one that you saw me burnishing with and I ended up um, putting some of the Dead Man Red clay slip on for decoration. That's the red color and it, it didn't really stick to the burnish and so um, there's, there's some combinations that don't work with the finishing that I, I learned from this one. The white is actually the Dead Man White uh, slip and it, it turned out quite well on the clay body but on the burnished and, and red slipped it started um, flaking off. But uh, anyway that's, that's what happened to that one. This one is quite su quite successful in that the white slip just um, did very well on top of the burnished. My burnishing is um, is a little less than satisfactory on this, but we're still using that old um, clay body that I had picked up down by the waterfall, and not the storm clay body. So. Um, and then after a while I discovered that the storm clay was really where it was at. There, there is a crack here so this clay body really didn't like to go through the temperature uh, changes involved with firing. So that's the result of that test was that it, uh, it was less than satisfactory for a clay body. This one is a little was another little test pot with some chucker feathers in it, and I I just formed it into um, almost closed. You can't close it because it would blow up. It wants a vent, but it's got little clay balls in it. Don't you think there's a lot of possibilities to making clay rattles? This was the one that we fired in our outdoor firing and I call it my chucker feather pot because the designs are based on the feathers that come from one of our little birds, um, a chucker. It's like a partridge. Um, so it cracked quite extensively and I've glued it back together. and. I'm quite happy that I won't be selling this one. The big lesson that the chucker pot has for me is that we have a lot of limitations with outdoor firing. Um, I was uh, following a lot of the instruction that I got by learning um, from the Mata Ortiz potters in uh, Casas Grandes and um, I realized that the, the Camador that they use is of a different type of clay than the one that I chose to use, which I just bought at a garden center. And it, it um, cracked and didn't offer the protection to the pot that it needed during that um, hot firing. Uh, also, I realized that in subsequent possible firing days, we were waiting for the weather, which didn't really pan out. And then by the time we did get some calm days, we had um, problems with uh, fire season here in the desert when uh, open fires aren't allowed. So, so what uh, I decided was that I wanted to get a small electric kiln uh, so that I wouldn't be restricted. But uh, it, was, it was kind of a hard compromise to make because I, I am kind of attached to uh, firing um, in, the, in the primitive way with my local clay. But um, 
I'm not saying that I won't ever fire outside again. Um, I just, uh, I think that there needs to be more research on firing here outdoors and um, that will be another journey for a video. I'm just checking my latest pot that I made yesterday and this is a flying saucer. I can see it's a little bit off but um, it's drying nicely and when I sand it I will probably adjust it a little bit in shape but I love this shape and I've made it before and it, it's basically formed uh, in, in some bowls and coiled and all put together with all the different um, techniques that I've learned for hand building. And now I'm just trying to get it to dry evenly. So uh, throughout the day I'll probably adjust it, it, reposition it so that the edges will dry nicely and not put too much stress on the hole. So yeah, I like the flying saucer shapes because there's a lot of room for decoration on there. And these shapes are, you know, these, these are the, like I mentioned, the, the, the classic sort of Nampayo, uh, you know, a nice round belly, nice ascending shape, and then almost a non-existent um, uh, rim here. Just um, and with my paddle and anvil method that I'm learning, it's not my method, it's a very ancient method, but I'm learning it, so it's new for me. But I'm, I'm able to get them much lighter, much thinner, and much stronger, so very resi resilient. I'm hoping that they will fire out as resiliently. bowls, which will perhaps become form uh, bowls for um, future pots. Do you remember when I was showing you about the paddle and anvil method? And I was looking, um, or I was referring to a large pot that I had drying in a basket? Well, here it is. It's sanded up beautifully and I've got, I just kind of went wild on these designs, these asymmetrical designs because the pot itself is a little asymmetrical. It hasn't been fired yet, but it's fun. It's a little, it's a departure from the symmetrical designing that I've been doing and it just felt really good. It all started here. This is the pure clay that came off the clay cliffs. This was the first stuff that I took home to try making pots with. I've discovered about clay which works uh, for hand building pottery um, is that there seems to be two kinds in this area and um, there's clay which has been sitting inert for several millennia since the Ice Age deposited it here and then there's alluvial clay, which has been moving around because of the wind and the rain and runoff, etc. And here we have an example of alluvial clay. It washed down um, just recently. We, we were in the, in the deluge that happened. The water came um, down this area here and flowed down the road and kind of filled up this puddle here, this little area. And 
so even though even though there's a lot of gravel and sand uh, if it was processed and put through the screening that we would find that there was a lot of elasticity and it's probably very good clay to use for pottery. So I've been thinking about the famous potters of the Southwest um, and them being a major inspiration for me and where did their inspiration come from? This uh, area had been a huge um, pottery area, ceramics area for a couple of thousand years according to the archaeological evidence but it had been lost and there was nobody making pots for probably uh, you know 50, 50 to 100 years it kind of had been lost and um, things weren't looking good for the pottery tradition in the southwest the Pueblo people and we had a few um, people wanting to rediscover that tradition but they had nothing to go by except the shards and the clay that they could find and uh, the technology that was available to them the open fires and um, the pigments that were in mineral form or plant form so it was a long process and we we have them to thank um, because we can access um, the information from their long learning process over the last hundred years or so. Um, I've mentioned a few of them. But uh, what do I have here? Um, there's no tradition. This, um, this area that's so rich in clay um, has no shards. And so I've had to use the shards of, uh, of uh, other, other cultures uh, to learn and the shards of knowledge that uh, these people um, hold. So I honor and thank them for that. But what I have here is just clay, just earth and the forces that move the clay around the, uh, the rain. Uh, which comes sporadically, um, the, the, the big river that's, that's pulling things down towards the sea. And um, so this video has just been to share with you my process of discovery. And um, one of the things that I learned first off was that in this area, right here, this is what we call the clay road, um, I, I saw some really pure clay falling off the cliffs and I took it home and tried to make pots out of it and I learned that um, the alluvial um, clay is better than just the clay that just falls off the cliffs um, fresh. So, um, so I went into, you know, I did my test pots with the clay road clay and um, today, I'm bringing them back, and I'm giving them back to the clay road. And um, uh, this is where they started, and this is where they'll sleep. And if someone comes along and finds them and decides to take them home and treasure them as um, shards and remnants of, of some process um, in some human hands, that's perfectly fine. I'm just turning them loose.